Okay. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, the second in our series of professional development seminars being sponsored by the National Center for Career and Technical Education Dissemination Center at Ohio State University. Uh, this is the second in a series of these seminars, which we will be offering uh, at approximately one month intervals uh, throughout this, the year. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Kurt Hafeli from the uh, Swiss Pedagogical Institute for Vocational Education. Uh, Dr. Hafeli is the head of their section for research and development. We are happy to welcome him to Ohio State and to the National Dissemination Center and to welcome him back to Ohio because in 1970 he spent a year in Dayton as an exchange student. He graduated from Wayne High School in Dayton and I'm sorry to say went on to the University of Michigan <laughs> for his baccalaureate degree. But uh, we welcome him to Ohio State anyway, and we look forward to his address. Dr. Hafley, uh, is positioned with the uh, Swiss uh, Pedagogical Institute, uh, involves uh, research on vocational education, and it has uh, he has in, been studying a topic such as school-to-work transition, Connections between education and the workplace, gender differences in vocational education and careers, and comparative vocational education. Uh, his topic today is going to be the Swiss system of vocational education. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hafeli to Ohio State. Well, thank you for this introduction. I'm very glad to be back in Ohio, as you said. Uh, my topic is, as you said, vocational education in Switzerland. Uh, so, I want to show you my first slide. So, this is not me, it could be me. <laughs> I want to show you in this hot weather some uh, nice things that you can do in Switzerland, of course. But um, that's uh, so much for the advertising, for the tourism. Uh, but it gives you also an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about. I want to give you first some general information on Switzerland so you know what the context, uh, what the context is. Then I'm going to give a brief introduction into the Swiss uh, educational system. And then I will concentrate, and that's the main part, on the vocational education system. And then I'll conclude with some uh, prospects, some uh, points of discussion. Let me come to the first point, general information. Two factors have made their mark on vocational education in Switzerland. Diversity and pragmatism. Both contribute to the quality of our vocational education. Where two cultures with a Germanic and Latin influence meet, there is a need for impartial openness to varying solutions. The development of the modern economy likewise leaves little room for inflexible schemata. Rather, it requires solutions that are suited to the region and to technology. One of the central issues has become a re-examination of the legal foundations. In Switzerland, we are in the process of taking the changing educational needs and profiles of activity into consideration of defining guidelines for new types of programs. In particular, the traditional separation into commercial, industrial, and social and healthcare programs should be done away with. The guiding principle will continue to be providing flexible opportunities for training that are based on the strengths of the various models in use, rather than establishing 
requirements that are meant to be as uniform as possible. In order to understand how the Swiss educational system works, some of the geographic, political, economic and cultural characteristics of the country need to be explained. Switzerland is, that's the map of Switzerland, is uh, divided geographically into three regions, of uh, which you know, of course, the Alps. That's about two-thirds of the whole country. Then you have what we call the, the central section, this part here, where most people are living. You have uh, cities like Geneva, Lausanne, Bern, Solothurn, a small city where I come from, Zurich, Lucerne, and you also have the Italian-speaking part with Lugano and Locarno. So, and the third part is what we call the Jura, the Jura, this part here, which is, which is mainly hills. So, most people live in, in this part of about 20-25% of the whole area. So, it's rather crowded in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland has 7 million inhabitants, not very many, 20% uh, are foreigners, mostly from Italy, ex-Yugoslavia and Spain. It has one of the high, Switzerland is, has one of the highest uh, foreign populations uh, in Europe. Politically, the country is divided into 26 cantons, each of which has a large degree of political autonomy especially in terms of how its educational system is organized. 64% of the population speaks Swiss German, so this is the map of the languages. This is more, uh, the red, reddish part, that's the Swiss German part. Then uh, about 20% speak uh, French. This part here, over here would be France, up here Germany, over there Austria, and here Italy, and this is about 8% of the population who speak Italian. And then the uh, violet, purple, that's Romansh, a very uh, small minority speak this language. And then we have uh, several percent uh, of people who have other languages as their native language. Let me come to the economy. Similar to other highly developed industrial nations, Switzerland, uh, Switzerland's earning and production structure is dominated by the service sector. You see the development uh, over the last uh, 25 years. The service sector has largely grown, industry has gone down, and agriculture is uh, not very important anymore. Small businesses play a major role in the economy. We have only uh, 176 businesses which employ more than 5,000 people. The most important branches of production are machine construction and the metal industry, uh, the manufacture of electronic, electrical and precision mechanical devices, as well as the chemical and pharmaceutical industries. Not only commerce and transport are of major significance for the service sector. Healthcare, services for enterprises in restaurant and hotel trade also play a major role. On the next slide you see the changes uh, in the last uh, uh, 15 years in selected branches. You see on the left hand the ones that have grown. Education, research, administration, that's where we are in, that's good. And you see the ones who have diminished, especially machine and metal industry, those were the ones who are traditionally very important in Switzerland. So there is the shift, uh, as in other highly developed uh, uh, nations, uh, toward the service industry. Overall, one can say, and the OECD study says that, even though stagnation and, uh, of the GDP uh, is, uh, there's been a lot of stagnation during the 90s and only uh, slow catch up in the last uh, two or three years. 
Swiss economy is still doing very well, has a very la- low unemployment rate, and the, it is one of the richest, one of the two or three richest countries in, in the world still. Let me come to the political system. The Swiss Confederation, which was founded in, 12 in 1291, we just celebrated the 709th uh, birthday on August the 1st. Uh, it has been a federal state since 1848. Some typical characteristics are federalism and communal autonomy. The cantons, or you would say the states, existed before the federal government did. In 1848, the cantons created the Swiss Confederation and assigned areas of responsibility to it that exceeded the capacities of the individual cantons. Until today, public education has remained under cantonal authority. The second characteristic, the exceptionally broad range of civil rights. Swiss citizens not only elect representatives to the national and cantonal parliaments, the cantonal governments and the most important communal authorities, they can also vote several times a year on various issues, also educational matters. The government at all levels, uh, and this is the third characteristic, is an expression of political consensus. For example, the administration at the national level is composed of representatives of the four largest political parties. So it's not this kind of majority system that you have or Germany has. These parties provide the seven members of the Executive Federal Council and together they have three-fourths of the seats in the Swiss Federal Parliament. Let me come to the second point, the survey of the Swiss educational system. In accordance with Switzerland's federalistic principles, all of those powers that the Constitution does not expressly delegate to the federal government fall under the jurisdiction of the canton. The national government may only take action in those areas stipulated by the federal constitution. As a result, the Swiss federal constitution does not provide any legal framework for a uniform regulation of the educational system. The cantons have the main jurisdiction over schools. The federal government so far only regulates vocational education in industry, commerce, trade, agriculture and home economics but in the future also in healthcare and social work. Why this is so, I will explain in a minute. On the next slide you see the structure of the educational system. The following types of schools can be found in Switzerland. You start with kindergarten as you do, at age four or five. And then we have compulsory public education usually starting uh, at the age when the child turns seven, and this lasts nine years. And what is important, an important difference is that at the lower secondary level, there is a tracking. You usually have three tracks after sixth grade, so there is a big decision when the child is 12 or 13 years old, according to uh, cognitive ability. Then the second uh, important point comes after ninth grade when the child is, or the adolescent is uh, 15, 16 years old. He or she has to decide what, what they want to do. Either they go, if they have the ability, to uh, what we call the gymnasium or the schools uh, which prepare for university entrance, which comes later on, or the majority who go into um, an apprenticeship and then also attend vocational schools. There are also other types of school teacher training institutes or what we call the um, diploma schools, which are full-time schools preparing for um, professions like uh, in the health sector. And uh, if you cannot decide or if you don't find what you want, there are pre-professional programs or uh, intermediate uh, programs such as introductory courses, integration courses, 
career orientation courses or just attending a 10th year of school. It's especially important for young people uh, from foreign countries who, for example, don't master the language. Then vocational training, usually in the form of an apprenticeship in, a, in an enterprise, lasts three to four years, sometimes with attendance at an advanced vocational school. After the upper secondary level, which means after 13th grade, usually at the age of 19 or 20, uh, you can go on to the universities, maybe you would call them research universities or the Federal Institute of Technology. Or if you have an advanced uh, degree here, you can go on to the universities of applied sciences. Or there are other possibilities preparing for um, vocational or higher vocational uh, certificates. There's also the term associate degrees, uh, which is not exactly the same as uh, you use here. So there are a number of uh, possibilities after after uh, upper secondary school. But in general, one can say, in comparison to the United States, that up until this level, upper secondary school, a lot of young people are in school. I will give you the numbers later. But at the post-secondary level, uh, we have less young people in education than you have. For example, we have uh, 10%, around 10% in universities in this type, and you have uh, uh, about 25%. And of course, to finish up, you have further and continuing education, uh, which becomes uh, more and more important. Maybe something to this transition here, at the end of, or towards the end of their compulsory schooling, young people in Switzerland, uh, as I said, have to decide what they want to do. They get career counseling, which is usually part of the curriculum at the lower secondary level. And they also get the individual career counseling. Not everybody uh, wants to do, wants to have it, but 60-70% um, receive individual career counseling which is non-compulsory, free, and provided by an independent public in institution. And there are also career choice prog programs during an intermediate year. Maybe I should add, um, as to the post-secondary level, that the universities, the research universities or the University of Applied Science, are basically free. Uh, or a very low tuition. They are run by the state or by the cantons. And uh, I think this is a very important uh, part of the Swiss educational system. There is hardly no private university or, or uh, University of Applied Science in, in Switzerland. Let me now take a closer look at upper secondary schools. A great majority of young people voluntarily attend some form of further education after finishing public school. You see here that close to 100%, more precisely about 90% of all young people, finish a school at the upper secondary level. Most of the young people then join the workforce, usually at the age of 19 to 21 years. Others continue their education at the post-secondary level. You see how this is divided up now by relative numbers. Blue line shows the 16-year-old uh, age group. And you see that most young people go into vocational education, which is the red line. And university preparation, this is uh, 15 to 20 percent, up close to 20 percent of uh, an age group uh, go into the university preparation. But one has to say that there are marked differences between um, young Swiss males and females and foreigners. You see, especially female foreigners, one-fourth of them, close to one-fourth, uh, leave 
school at the uh, compulsory level and does not get any further education. And also, close to 20%, every fifth young male foreigner uh, is not uh, in the school anymore after 16 years of age. So that's a big problem. I'll come to that back later. And I think it is especially uh, grown in the last few years since we have had a lot of immigration from ex-Yugoslavia. And these young people came at an age uh, of maybe 12, 13, where they had already acquired uh, some of the educational background in a very different culture and uh, a very different language, of course. Let me come to um, the vocational education system. In this section, I give you a more detailed description of those parts of the educational system that concentrate on training to prepare for working life, training while working, and further professional training. As a result of historical developments, and until recently, the lack of a common foundation in the Constitution, several quite different systems of vocational education have evolved. The predominant form of the vocational education is the apprenticeship. And you see more or less the same graph, but now concentrated on vocational education. So we have the apprenticeship here. <clears throat> on the job training in a firm, which is accompanied by attendance at a vocational school. Uh, the dual system, or uh, by attending a vocational school and an introductory course, which we call the triad system. Some occupations can be learned either through an apprenticeship or by attending a specialized trade school or a training workshop program. Full-time vocational schools are more common in the western part of Switzerland and in the Italian part than in the German-speaking part. This is a reflection of different traditions. Although the Swiss vocational education system is based on a dual system similar to Germany and Austria, the French-speaking and Italian-speaking parts of the country are influenced by their neighbors, France and Italy, where vocational education is oriented more toward the attending school. In terms of quantity, the most important sectors of, for vocational training are industry, the crafts, trade, banking, insurance, transport, restaurant and hotels, other service sectors, and home economics. Vocational training in these sectors is regulated by the Federal Vocation Education Act. The health sector, nursing, midwives, medical therapy, and medical technology is another important part, especially for young women. The cantonal public health authorities have delegated the job of regulating, supporting, and controlling the training in most of these professions to the Swiss Red Cross. The training institutions, for example, healthcare schools, are responsible for training. They work together closely with the institutions where internships take place, mostly hospitals. So... Let me go back here to the 10 most important apprenticeships for women. Uh, maybe some of the terms are uh, a little bit strange for you, but you can get the feeling of, of what fields uh, young uh, women go into. An office work. This would be a business school, commercial graduate, more school school type uh, preparation for office. Um, this is uh, also in the office uh, but um, on the lower level and then you see a number of health uh, professions. And you see it's very uh, concentrated. 62% of, of all females are in 10 professions. So even though we have more than 200 different uh, professions or occupations, um, uh, young people are very much concentrated. On the next one, you see the male apprenticeship contract. You see again on the first uh, place office, also for males. But I think there is a difference here because in, in, in Switzerland, at least, this is a very broad 
occupation which uh, gives you a lot of in, uh, possibilities to go into managerial uh, uh, positions, for example. And then you have, um, maybe you would call it construction uh, electrician. This I learned you would probably call the uh, cabinet builder. And um, you have uh, a related one, timbering carpenter, or somebody who is um, working and uh, making the roof or the stairs, and you see the other professions. This is less concentrated among males. You see here, 10 professions uh, gives you 43%. So there are a, lot, a larger array of, um, of, uh, of apprenticeships for males. Let me come to a little bit to the history of vocational education. Vocational education, as it is known today, was created at the end of the 19th century. We have uh, some very important uh, leaders like Rousseau or Pestalozzi, which are Swiss, and they had a lot of influence into how the Swiss educational system was and the philosophy was created. 100 years before the French Revolution, at the end of the 18th century, destroyed the traditional form of training that went back to the Middle Ages and was regulated by the guilds. Let me show you here the apprenticeship uh, certificate. The one on the top is from 1764 and is uh, handed out by the guilds. And you can see uh, it's very nicely done and uh, uh, not too many young people got it and uh, especially not very many females. <clears throat> In the middle of the 19th century, Swiss enterprises were confronted with international competition for the first time because of the free trade agreements, liberalism and improved transportation railways. So I think there are a lot of parallels to the situation we have now. For the emerging machine factories, banks and commercial enterprises, these new conditions were a challenge that they met successfully. And I must say, in, uh, in contrast to the United States, machine factories and large enterprises thought that uh, apprenticeship, even though... Uh, developed in, a, in a, maybe a different way, that apprenticeship would be a very good form of training young people and not just train them on the job later on. So they counted on the apprenticeship system. Trades, however, were hurt by international competition because their structures were outmoded and the employees insufficiently trained. For this reason, in 1884, the federal parliament decided to support and consequently also to regulate, to a certain degree, the crafts and trade schools as a measure to promote the economy, thus making the trades more competitive again. The schools were set up in much the same way as today, with two groups of subjects, occupation-related subjects and general subject, subjects. The federal government received further powers, such as establishing training regulations through an amendment to the federal constitution in 1908, which permitted it to set up uniform regulations for the trades. However, at first, the promotion of practical training remained in the hands of trade associations. So you see the second uh, diploma here is handed out in 1923 by... Uh, Trade Association, it's not a, a public uh, authority, uh, because the first uh, federal law on vocational education was only passed in 1930. This law charged the Swiss federal government with the regulation of practical and theoretical education. Final examinations for apprenticeship certificates and attendance at vocational schools were declared obligatory for apprentices. And so you see the third um, uh, diploma, which uh, still looks the same today. Uh, this is handed out uh, to all the young people who finish 
an apprenticeship <coughs> and it has the Swiss um, uh, flag on it. Vocational education did not really get a boost until after World War II. Oops. You can see this here. At this time, more and more of the population began to consider it normal for boys and girls leaving the compulsory schools to continue their education at an upper secondary level, be it an apprenticeship, at a trade school or at a school preparing for the university entrance certificate. The Vocational Education Act was revised in 1963 and 78, and as I said, the further revision is underway right now. Let me come to legislation and implementation. <coughs> As legislation on vocational education is based on an article in the federal constitution concerned with the national economy, the federal government's powers are or were until recently limited to education and further professional development for occupations belonging to industry, the crafts, the trades, agriculture and domestic services. Consequently, vocational education falls under the jurisdiction of the Federal Department of Economic Affairs. So we don't have an educational department. In 1999, the Federal Constitution was revised and the sound basis for extending federal competence to regulating and supporting vocational education in all areas of professional life was created, including social and artistic fields and the healthcare profession. So this is very important in terms of uh, equality uh, among gender, because, uh, as I said, healthcare was uh, so far regulated uh, by the Red Cross, and also uh, differently financed. Apart from the Vocational Education Act, sections of the Swiss Law of Obligations are of major importance for vocational education. According to Swiss Law, the contract of apprenticeship is a special form of employment contract, thus falling under the jurisdiction of civil law. The Federal Office for Professional Education and Technology, here, which is under the Federal Department of Economic Affairs, works together with industrial organizations to establish the training and examination regulations for individual occupations and to create the syllabi for the vocational schools. And the institute I'm working uh, is also part of the federal office, where we mainly uh, train teachers for vocational schools. The cantons have set up their own offices of vocational education here. This is at the state level. To implement the Vocational Education Act. These offices are especially concerned with the vocational schools, supervising the apprenticeships, and organizing and carrying out the final ex examinations for the apprenticeship certificates. The authorities' most important partners are employers' associations and labor organizations, organizations which include on the one hand top organizations and on the other hand professional associations. The professional associations, usually those of the employers, submit proposals for new or revised training regulations and usually also formulate the, examinations question, the examination questions on behalf of the authorities. Of course, the trade associations are, uh, if you want to, a follow-up of the guild in a different form, of course. According to law, the trade or the professional associations are also charged with working out the so-called training programs to promote the systematic training of apprentices. In addition, representatives of the associations belong to all of the pertinent bo supervisory boards, examining boards, working groups, etc., whereby parity between labor representatives and employer representatives is taken into consideration. Some of the organizations also create teaching materials 
and the responsible authorities can also entrust them with the realization of the final examinations for the apprenticeship certificate. So these associations are very important uh, for, uh, for the functioning of the vocational system. Let me now come uh, to the dual and triad system. And uh, let me point out some of the spec uh, specifications. The original form of training in an apprenticeship consisted of two learning venues, the dual system, the firm where the apprentices were trained, and the vocational school. During the first half of this century, or last century, the amount of time spent at the vocational school increased from half a day to one or two days a week. The Vocational Education Act designates a maximum of two days of school. Included in this attendance uh, is uh, attendance in electives and remedial courses. You can see this um, on the upper part, which is the example of a small firm. You see on the job training, the red one is the most important part of it. And the red one is the vocational school, as I said, one to two uh, school days per week. And then you have additional courses you can take. And depending, uh, if you're in an advanced vocational school, you have two days of school. The picture is a little bit different for large enterprises. Uh, school is usually um, uh, takes more time because these uh, are different occupations. And training in the enterprise is smaller productive work is a smaller proportion and we have more training workshops or internal school. So, what makes the apprenticeship special in educational terms are its twofold objectives. To provide both training and knowledge, qualifications and personal development. According to uh, Article 6 of the Vocational Education Act, basic training provides, quote, the skills and knowledge necessary to perform an occupation. It broadens general knowledge and promotes personal development and a sense of responsibility. Furthermore, it provides the foundations for continuing education, both professional and general, end of quote. I think this is very important, so it's not just the vocational uh, goal, but also personal development, which is important. On the job training, practical training takes place in the firm. Many firms share this job in training. Alliances, large firms move many of the training tasks to their training workshops, training laboratories, practice offices, or internal schools. This is not only common for industry, but also for stores, large banks, insurance companies, or restaurant chains, for example. However, real tasks are always used to deepen and practice what has been learned. Also, the proportion of training time spent on them may vary greatly. But in small firms, this is the most important part. The contract of apprenticeship is a special kind of private law employment contract, it is only valid once it has been approved by a cantonal office of vocational education and it has to be signed by uh, the young person or uh, his or her parents and the firm. However, regulation and supervision are limited uh, to aspects uh, for the cantonal office that are relevant to the training program. For example, how much the, apprenticeship, uh, the apprentice earns his wage is not regulated. The apprentice must negotiate this with the firm where he or she plans to train. Also, many professional associations do provide guidelines. They usually earn about one-fourth of, uh, of the salary they earn afterwards. But, of course, less in the first year and then it, uh, uh, they earn more in the last year. On-the-job trainers 
are either the owners of the firms themselves or more commonly other professionals with job experience or journey persons. Each trainer has to attend a training course of at least 40 hours that has a curriculum that complies with what the federal government has determined to be necessary. The courses are usually offered by the cantons and professional associations. They may also be integrated in a program to become a master. There is no final examination for this. For the introductory courses in the training centers that run introductory courses, the courses are taught in blocks of three or four days a week. Depending on the profession, they last two to 20 weeks distributed all over, over all of the years of the apprenticeship. In the training centers where they are held, the teachers are either full-time trainers or professionals who have been hired part-time by the institutions, especially for those occupations where there are only a few apprentices. And the third part are the courses at vocational schools. Every apprentice must attend a vocational school which is free of tuition. Courses of vo- at vocational schools are held in classes of 10 to 24 students. The goal is to have classes of apprentices in the same occupation and at the same level. However, because there are more than 200 possible occupations, it is not easy to achieve this goal. As a result, for some occupations, the students attend so-called intercantonal trade courses or specialized courses that are held in blocks. Usually classes are held on one to two school days a week with nine or eight lessons per day. For many years there has been some experimentation with block courses, but this type of course organization has not become established yet. In some occupations, however, attendance at a vocational school is intensified in the first year and gradually reduced towards the end of the apprenticeship. In most cases, vocational schools are financed by the cantons or the communities. But associations often run their own schools as well. Most of the commercial business schools are run by local business associations. Some of the trade associations also train the next generation themselves, for example, for occupations like plasterer or roofer. Similar to the training place, the training that takes place in the firm and in introductory courses, the courses at vocational schools are oriented to the occupation to be learned. The so-called specialized courses, 5 to 14 lessons per week, depending on the occupation, are supplemented by classes in general knowledge, which are independent of the occupation being learned. They are held for three lessons each week and serve as an orientation held for young adults in their current situation as apprentices. The development of language skills and a certain foundation of general knowledge, for example, legal rights, work, family, environment, form the basic curriculum. The teachers strive to achieve independent, self-responsible and self-determined learning. In order to realize this, the teachers are given a great degree of freedom. Lessons in physical education supplement every day at school. Engineers and masters with supplementary training at the Swiss Pedagogical Institute for Vocational Education, where I'm coming from, teach the specialized classes. Academics and teachers from the primary and secondary level are trained at our institute or at the university to teach the classes in general knowledge. At business schools, most of the teaching is generally done by teachers who get their training at the university. Uh, Maybe a word about final examinations. Basic training ends with the final examination for the apprenticeship certificate, consisting of a test on workmanship quality, the practical work, which is held at the apprentice's firm or in special localities, an examination in theory related to the occupation, and an examination in general knowledge. Depending on the occupation and the subject, The grades the apprentice has achieved at the course in the vocational schools are also taken into consideration. The examination is under the jurisdiction of the cantons and is run by groups of experts, 
Each year approximately 20,000 experts from trade and industry participate in the examinations. In some regions and for some occupations, a professional association organizes the examination and the commission of the canton or the federal government. Whenever possible, the examination questions are formulated uniformly for a whole language region. After passing the examination, the apprentices are awarded a federal certificate of competence, which you have seen, with a supplementary page listing their grades. In addition, the firm where apprentices were trained gives them a certificate of employment for the period of their apprenticeship. Now we have also training for special groups. Let me go back here. Uh, for example, for the ones who are, their cognitive ability is a little bit um, weakened here, the elementary training. This scheme was created in the 80s for young people who primarily have more practical abilities. Similar to regular apprentices, the apprentices doing elementary training work in a firm and attend special classes at a vocational school one day a week. However, however only a few uh, percent of all apprentices are enrolled in an elementary training program. Nonetheless, it has become established as an important opportunity for those young people who are scholastically weak to get some professional training. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have the gifted students who can attend uh, advanced vocational schools. This is over here. Advanced vocational schools offer talented and motivated apprentices a broader general education in addition to the compulsory subjects for professional and personal development also giving them the skills to enter, uh, they need to enter a more demanding program later. In order to prepare for an advanced level of, of a vocational diploma, the students do an apprenticeship in a firm or a training center and attend a vocational school. However, they go to school half a day or one whole day longer than the other apprentices. <coughs> During this extra time at school, they attend courses in general subjects according to a special curriculum. In addition to the final examination for the apprenticeship certificate, the students also have to pass a further final examination, the successful completion of which is prerequisite for receiving the advanced level vocational diploma, which we call Berufsmaturität which gives them the right to attend the Universities of Applied Science sciences later on. So they can advance up here. You can do this parallel to the apprenticeship or you can do it afterwards in one year or uh, part-time in two years. Let me come um, towards the conclusion, something about the finances, about money. Vocational schools are funded almost exclusively by the state. The federal government covers 10 to 30 percent. The remainder is either covered solely by the canton or shared between the canton and the community. Professional associations contribute by financing materials and courses for continuing education. The training centers where introductory courses are held are usually run by trade associations. Expenses are shared by the state and the associations. In addition, the firms that send apprentices to these programs have to contribute to the funding, which can often amount to several thousand francs per apprentice over the years of their training. At the moment, possibilities for easing the burden of the master's tutors in the firms are being discussed with the objective of, prom of promoting greater willingness to take on apprentices. For the time being, however, the training in the firms will continue to be completely financed by the firms themselves and the people in training. These people make a substantial contribution to covering the costs through their work. The ratio between costs and earnings varies greatly from enterprise to enterprise and from branch to branch. According to recent studies, the yields cover the costs for small enterprises. In large enterprises, on the other hand, the cost exceeds the quantifiable 
yields by 10 to 20,000 francs per apprentice in year. So by, um, let's say, um, 6 to 15,000 dollars per apprentice in year. However, it has not been taken into consideration that some savings or yields are not directly reflected in these figures. For example, that the costs for hiring personnel are lower and that when apprentices are hired after their apprenticeship, less time is needed for training or that the young people have a positive effect on the atmosphere in offices and workshops. Well, let me show another figure here. Um, on the top you see the public expenses which uh, covers about one third of the whole expenses for or whole costs uh, divided by confederation cant uh, cantons and communities and then the other two thirds are covered by the firms and this is maybe a little bit uh, confusing here is the, the cover totally is 3.8 billion and if you subtract what the apprentices contribute by their work you have net expenses of 2.1 billion so most of the costs are uh, uh, covered by the firms let me come to, to uh, some conclusions The OECD, in a recent study on um, when comparing uh, different countries uh, in the transition, transition from school to work, has stated Switzerland stands out for the success of the transition of its young people to working life. And the Swiss attach great significance to vocational education, especially in the form of the apprenticeship. The apprenticeship is considered to be especially well suited to young people because of the combination of working at a job and attending school and the fact that learning takes place through doing real tasks. So we think that the socialization that takes place is very important, also meeting with adults and uh, doing uh, tasks that have a, <coughs> a significance. It is also, the system is also flexible in that it allows ongoing adjustments to the changing needs of industry and society by creating new uh, occupations, by changing the regulations. It is reasonable in terms of cost. An apprentice only costs the state a fraction of what a student preparing for the university does. It is workforce oriented. Young people having finished their vocational training can immediately begin working productively in their special fields. Many of the young people finishing their apprenticeships are offered a job by the firm they are doing their training in. So we have a very low unemployment rate and what the young people acquired are socially rec recognized qualifications on a national level with those certificates that they get. And finally, uh, the apprenticeship is considered career-oriented. The completion of an apprenticeship offers many career possibilities, such as continuing education in specialized colleges and advanced uh, vocational schools, vocational certificates, higher vocational certificates, and the universities of applied sciences. On the other hand, a number of critical points have been raised recently. Lower attraction. The young people themselves or their parents are increasingly more interested in attending a school that prepares for the university entrance certificate instead of doing an apprenticeship. Social prestige may play a major role or the fact that young people wish to postpone making definite career decisions. So the Swiss government has uh, started a federal apprenticeship campaign which, this is Italian, or uh, French, says, my boss has all also been an apprentice, or I can show you this, even in English. <laughs> so this has been distributed by the federal government. Or, you can see the next one, I'm going to be a millionaire. <laughs> 
So, uh, this is how the government tries to uh, promote uh, the apprenticeship. But there's another critical point, social problems. Young people with scholastic or social deficits, especially in the cities or suburbs, and with a foreign background, have increasing difficulty of finding an adequate apprenticeship. And finally, and maybe most important, a uh, critical point of inflexibility. Like many other countries, Switzerland is shifting from a manufacturing to a service and information-based economy. These trends have important implications for vocational education. The question remains open whether the Swiss vocational education system is flexible enough to adjust to the necessary changes. Maybe we can discuss these issues now. Thank you. Mm-hmm. The question was uh, about the incentives or disincentives that the firms might have for employing apprentices. I think one one of the reasons is uh, that they would employ apprentices is tradition. It's always been done this way, so we have uh, the system uh, with young people coming into a firm, and that's the way the labor is organized. You have to have, for example, if you do construction, you have to have at least two people helping each other. And so it's uh, convenient to have a young person who you don't have to pay very much uh, for economic reasons also, that you uh, think it's uh, important to have uh, apprentices. The second reason um, is they want to have uh, uh, they want to, re- to recruit their own people and they want to form their own people the way they think is best. So they form themselves and um, of course that's the tradition of the, of the guilds. Uh, why they don't take apprentices? And this has been a concern in the last few years. I think the first fact is again tradition or no tradition especially in the information technology based occupations there is no tradition there are maybe multinational firms also American firms where you don't have this kind of system so there is great concern over uh, over these kinds of uh, changes that take place you have academics at the at the top level of, of management and they don't know the system and traditionally in, in uh, a lot of these firms you have people who know the system or have gone through this kind of system. And then, uh, of course, um, some firms and in some occupations uh, there is growing concern of how can you uh, provide training in the traditional kind of tra- uh, apprenticeship uh, when you need so much schooling or so much formal training before. So uh, there is growing concern that for some occupations you need more formal schooling or maybe uh, uh, one whole school year before in, in, in an apprenticeship kind of way, but uh, much more oriented to uh, basic education in, in, a special, uh, in a special occupation. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the UK a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, this system would have had the four year last two years of the high school, what they call technical school, which mm-hmm. is basically four years. For all the same reasons that you just outlined at the end and under your criticism of the apprenticeship program, you're having that with including the two years of the last two years of high school and kind of the, what we would call the 13th and 14th year over here. Mm-hmm. And so their solution is to, to put those programs back into what they call a comprehensive secondary school. Mm-hmm. In your system, you, you wouldn't have a, a, a comprehensive, would that be right? Yes. The question was that... It wouldn't be an option. Right? No. Uh, the question was, um, repeating it, uh, how this compares to the United the system in the United Kingdom, where you have uh, uh, 
something like a, a comprehensive secondary uh, system. Um, if we have something like this too, I would say no. Uh, it's the one of the marks or one of the uh, special uh, attributes of the Swiss system is that it differentiates at a very early age. So what we are trying to do is to make the system more flexible so you can change afterwards. Uh, but of course, um, the, the question remains open whether that's so easy. And especially at university level, for um, people who go into this track of um, the research universities and have this uh, access to the university, they can change to the, to the University of Applied Sciences, but right now, not the other way around. So we are trying to set up... Uh, different but equal um, systems uh, for the young people but um, it is a challenge because there is so much go construction in the, in, the, in the educational system going on that uh, we are really trying to make it more flexible. I have a follow-up question in terms of the European Union, mm -hmm. from a policy perspective, are they looking at those towards developing a educational need? Okay, the question of, uh, on the European Union uh, perspective, if there is um, social policy in, in this kind of uh, uh, young people, um, since Switzerland is not in the, Europa, in the European Union, uh, <laughs> which I regret, <laughs> uh, um, it's, I think it's hard to say something about uh, the common policy in the European Union. Maybe Philip can, can uh, say more about it. But um, but I think there is there is one one um, difficulty in the European Union. You have very different systems. You have the more school oriented system, uh, which most countries in the European uh, Union uh, follow, and then you have the minority of uh, this apprenticeship system, which is mainly, as I said, in Germany and Austria and and uh, Denmark and so on. But but this is only a um, minority. So there is a trend, I would say, towards uh, more schooling at the secondary level, at the upper secondary level. That, that I think this is the, the, the big trend. So some people say the apprenticeship uh, system is losing. It's being imported into um, uh, third world countries, but not in the Western and industrialized uh, countries. But uh, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but maybe Philip wants to... Um, Actually, I think you are absolutely right in saying that uh, what is often uh, misunderstood uh, in the Americas is that uh, the European Union has totally different uh, systems of vocational education and training in its member countries. And so there is some policy on vocational education and training uh, from the European Union, but this often neglects uh, those differences. And so I think quite an ongoing debate at the moment, how we can mm -hmm. focus it. Okay. Philippe, who is from Germany, uh, yes. said, okay, that this, uh, there are large differences and there is no common social policy to be seen at the moment. Mm -hmm. Ten years ago, for a student to have minimal curriculum at the university, they needed to attend the university in their own campus, my understanding. Does that still take place? Mm -hmm. The question is uh, whether in, in Switzerland, if you want to attend university, you, you have to, to go to the one that's in your uh, canton or not, uh, because of tuition reasons, or on the second question, if the vocational schools are specialized according to cantons. Uh, university, uh, you can move wherever you want to, but your canton has to cover the costs uh, for the other, uh, for, for your university um, uh, program that you're attending. So there is a lot of uh, interchange and, and economical flow, yes. And, um, but you're free to, to go wherever you want to. But actually, a lot of, uh, most of the young people go to the university that's closest where they're living, you know. <clears throat> 
there is some specialization going on, but not very much. And uh, the, since it's um, cantonal authority, and not every canton has university, they just build up whatever they think is good. And um, so on the federal level, there is some, de- some debate on concentrating uh, certain fields at this or that university, but it's very hard, you know, because there is no... Well, there is some some possibility uh, by, by financi- financing by, because the federal government also gives uh, some money to the universities, but it's mainly the cantons who have the authority. And the second question is uh, about specialization uh, of vocational schools according to cantons. Yes, there is some, but this depends very much on uh, the economic situation of the canton. If, if one industry is strong, or one trade, uh, one certain branch is strong, then you have the uh, classes in these special uh, fields, in this occupation, and so there might be some specialization. And if you are in a special occupation, you might have to travel a little bit to go to some other place for vocational school. Yeah. Does the uh, federal government or the canton collect evaluation data, follow-up surveys, students, mm-hmm. employers? Okay, the question is whether the federal or canton authorities uh, uh, have eva- or do evaluation studies, follow-ups of, of their graduates. So far, hardly no studies exist um, because the system has been functioning so well. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, <clears throat> that's one explanation. <clears throat> yes, that's what the OECD uh, report says. Um, you know, in the last few years there has been some change and some debate of whether the system really works that well in the future. So far it has worked very well. So, as a researcher I'm glad that there is some change and that there are some questions being made. And in fact, the director of the of the... Uh, Federal Office for Vocational uh, for Professional Education uh, was amazed when he uh, 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 got appointed director that there was hardly any uh, research on vocational education in Switzerland. So we have set up now a fund, uh, finances of several millions a year to do research in vocational education and this includes also evaluation studies. So far hardly non studies. Yeah, Philip? I'd be interested in how um, the Swiss system uh, reacts on like the growing need uh, for flexibility and uh, broader transferable skills and uh, such things. Mm-hmm. Because I think that is um, quite a big problem in Germany. Yeah. Or not to. Yeah. <laughs> The question is, how does the Swiss vocational system react to the growing need of flexibility uh, to broaden uh, the qualifications? Um, of course, that was one of the questions that I that I asked, and I think there are some answers that are given. For example, in the machine industry, there has been a large reform in the last uh, four or five years whereby the number of occupations have been reduced dramatically from over 25 to about five different uh, occupations. So they are broader now. You're not a specialized when you finish. Of course, the question is, what, what do you learn then? But uh, the goal is clearly that young people are being, prefer- pre- uh, are being trained uh, on much more broad scale, much more to be much more flexible, and this has come from from uh, the industry itself, because they cannot use uh, very specialized people anymore because the things change so fast. So they have to have people who have uh, broad abilities, what we call key qualifications. Um, there is a lot of um, searching going on uh, in how to do this and how to uh, train young people. Uh, in, in, in developing broad uh, capacities, capabilities. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of uh, broad capacities and change, uh, 
after the formal school was over and whatever it formed, the community and further education, does the government or industry or somebody have requirements in terms of uh, continuing on and maintaining skills, developing new skills? That's mm-hmm. what you're saying? Mm-hmm. The question is um, related to the broad capacities. Is uh, in continuing education the government um, doing uh, very much or uh, has a policy? I would say at the moment no. Uh, the further and continuing education is regarded as uh, an individual uh, kind of enterprise whereby the individual is responsible. And uh, so there's not much money going into it. There's no no legal um, foundation for it at the moment. And the firms do it, you know, very much according to their needs, of course. You know, they they have their training schemes for for whatever is going on, but not in a in a broad sense. So it's very much up uh, on the up, upon the individual to to keep up and to do what we call the lifelong uh, learning. So I think that's another uh, big question. And what we're trying to do, and this has been a major reform of uh, the Swiss uh, continuing education, is to uh, build up a credit system. I mean, uh, I don't have to tell you how that works. <laughs> but for 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 uh, the Swiss system, which is uh, much more um, built upon long kind of education and then the final examination to break this up and, and make modules, what we call it, and, and, and to finish uh, each module and get credit for it. That's, that's, uh, that's a major reform, I would say, paradigm uh, change that's going on right now, at least on the, on the level of continuing education. Yeah, Philip. And which role or is, uh, do they do these uh, modules play a role in the initial vocational education training system? Yes. The question is whether this module or credit system plays a role in the initial training. Yes, at first it was developed for the continuing education, but then of course associations think, okay, if this works here, why can we not transfer it to uh, the initial training? So there's uh, some experimenting going on, for example, in the information technology uh, occupation or also in the business occupation, where uh, there are a lot of changes now. And so we are trying to build a combination of traditional apprenticeship, where you have a certain degree of, of um, basic uh, training for everyone, and then in the second or third year, you have specialization according to the needs of the firm and the needs of the individual. More on the module-based uh, uh, kind of training. Yes. Uh, what opportunities are actually challenging opportunities? So, are there for adults who are training in one area, for example, as a carpenter, and then decide they want to go to university at a later time in their life? Mm-hmm. Are the challenges as anybody getting back to the university system at that point, or are they mm-hmm. pretty well um, easy to yeah. The question was uh, what kind of possibilities are there for adults uh, to get into the educational system again, for example, as a carpenter going to the university? I would say um, your system is more flexible than, than our system. Um, even though, you, if you want to be precise, you can say, for example, in Geneva, there is a possibility for adults without uh, maturity, without this um, certificate for university certificate entrance uh, ticket, to get into the university on a portfolio basis. But that's not the general kind of, of thing. So, um, there is a lot of debate going on on opening up the system, but at the moment, um, I, I would say it's not as flexible as the system here. Yes. Mm-hmm. The question is uh, 
the male and female proportion in apprentices and uh, wage di- whether there are wage differences during the apprenticeship and or afterwards. Yes, there is a, a, a difference. I think uh, almost every uh, Western uh, country you see these differences, and there uh, in Switzerland. Even though we have we have uh, laws and, and and federal acts on this, uh, which you are not allowed to do, this, but there are still differences. And the, the main difference is that males and females go into different occupations, and the, the, the female-dominated occupations are less well paid, and so you have these differences even during apprenticeship and and afterwards as well. For example, in the health professions, they are not as well paid as, uh, for example, policemen. So there is um, a lot of debate going on in this field. And even within the same occupation, outside of the federal branch, where I would say um, studies show that it's, it's pretty equal, outside you have a lot of reasons why women get paid a little bit less. <coughs> Yes, this um, question was whether there is any encouragement uh, for young women to go into occupations that pay them better. Yes, there has been um, uh, some proposals and um, there is a lot of money spent right now to get young people into apprenticeships, like I said, and there is um, more than one third of the budget is reserved for campaigns, especially for young women and to create more equality among uh, the sexes. But I must say the Swiss um, system as far as gender equality is concerned is, is, is a very conservative system. It, and then one explanation is that in the past Switzerland has been so rich that um, women didn't have to go to work. So, um, and, uh, so it's a very, uh, not very, but it's, it's a traditional uh, system. Any additional questions? Yes. Does the language of instruction vary by region? And what effect does that have on foreign population? Okay, the question was <coughs> whether the language of instruction varies by region and what effect does this have on foreign population? Yes, the language uh, varies according to where you're going to school. It's either French, Italian, or, or German, or Romansh. <coughs> And you have to acquire the language wherever you are going to school. Which means that for um, uh, an Italian uh, going to school in the French part is easier than in the German-speaking part because the differences are, are less. So it depends uh, where you're going to school and you see less differences or less, um, um, yeah, less differences in, 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 in the Latin-speaking uh, part of, of Switzerland. But of course, we have now other other uh, groups, other foreigners coming from other uh, backgrounds with Slavic languages, and uh, there you have problems uh, in all the regions. So this is a big problem, and and that's why we are trying to to set up programs uh, uh, as far as language training is concerned. But also there are also other other um, matters to be taught. Uh, before they enter the apprenticeship. I'm sorry, I'm just a couple minutes late. Was anything said about copies of the uh, presentation? Is it possible to get a copy of the information that you presented? It is on our website, available now. Uh, go to www.nccpd.com. Uh, and it is available in PDF or what other form? HDF. That's right, page. That's right, page. Okay, the question was whether the papers are available. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, We appreciate very much your uh, very enlightening discussion of the Swiss system. I think it uh, always uh, broadens our own perspective on our uh, own systems here when we hear of other systems and the uh, the way they're structured to deliver 
uh, workforce preparation and deal with many of the problems which we encounter also. So we appreciate very much your, your willingness to uh, meet with us. Uh, Kurt also spent some time at our uh, sister or counterpart institution uh, before coming to the Dissemination Center. He spent a few weeks out in Minneapolis, St. Paul, with the National Research Center for Career and Technical Education. And the uh, director of that center will be our speaker in six weeks on September 20th. Uh, Dr. Charles Hopkins, the director of the National Research Center, will uh, deliver our third in this series of professional development seminars. I'm very pleased to see we have some guests in the audience today. Uh, our state director, uh, Joanne Keister, uh, for career, vocational, and career, <laughs> technical, and adult education. I still fall back to the old terminology sometimes. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but uh, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, express the regrets of our director, Floyd McKinney. This is the second of these seminars, which he has not been able to host, but Floyd is uh, actively disseminating. He... <laughs> He is attending a technical assistance workshop, which is being conducted by the Federal Office of uh, Vocational and Adult Ed out in Portland, Oregon, all this week. Uh, but he assures me he will be back for the third uh, in the series when Charles is here. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Brian, our technology director, for setting everything up. And a special vote of thanks to uh, Steve Chambers and his assistant, Jay Wu, the chairs which you are sitting on were delivered at 1 o'clock today. The chairs which had been in here this morning were all removed from this room, and Steve got it all set up in time for the presentation. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll look forward to seeing you for Charles Hopkins' presentation.